Good morning, everyone. I'm not sure that anyone had this marked down on the Chamber of Sweepstakers being a sellout. <laughs> and uh, it's lovely to see so many people here. And um, thank you very much for coming. Um, I would say Chapman has rules apply, except we're being filmed. It's going to go on uh, the Chamber's website, so there's absolutely no point pretending to Chatham has rules, even if I'm going to say um, some things which might suggest I'm not entirely in agreement with pronouncements by uh, former members of Chambers who have got on to my project things. So um, there we are, that's just um, one of those things. I I'm going to start, if I may, um, by reminding you of a disciplinary case which took, uh, was heard by the FRC just two years ago at, and in which some of the people in this room I know uh, were involved, in which members of KPMG's audit teams at Carillion were charged in relation to documents produced by them for the purposes of an audit quality review inspection into the Carillion audit for 2017 and also an earlier audit into another listed company called Regenesis. So basically there had been an AQR inspection into Regenesis in 2015. That went through without any issues. Then two years later there was an AQR inspection into the Carillion 2017 audit. Uh, and subsequent to that audit, KPMG realised that some documents being produced for the purposes of the AQR inspection but the provenance of those documents have not necessarily been made clear to the inspection team. Uh, and KPMG also did a deep dive into earlier AQR inspections <coughs> involving members of the um, Carillion audit team uh, and identified that a similar issue had arisen in relation to the, uh, the Genesis inspection. Now, the Carillion audit report had been signed on the 1st of March 2017. Um, the AQR inspection took place principally in October of 2017 and a number of documents were produced at the time of the AQR inspection which appeared to be contemporaneous to the audit. The documents in question um, were a series of meeting minutes between the KPMG team and the auditors of some of Carillion's overseas subsidiaries as well as a document known as the Construction Contract Scoping, or CCS, paper. Uh, and the CCS paper purported to identify how the audit team would select construction contracts for substantive testing during the course of the audit. Now, those documents were passed to the AQR team on the 12th of October 2017 without any accompanying suggestion uh, that they were anything other than contemporaneous to the audit. The FRC charged the people involved in the creation and dissemination of the documents with dishonesty on the grounds that they had either intended to mislead the AQR team into thinking that the documents were contemporaneous or they had been reckless as to the possibility of the AQR team being so misled. There was an alternative charge as well in the formal complaint, which was relying on the same alleged facts. The FRC said that the people involved had in the alternative acted with a lack of integrity. Okay. Now, there was no dispute that meetings had been held between the audit team and the overseas auditors. Those meetings should have been minuted and copies of the minutes should have been saved to the audit file as audit evidence relied upon in support of the audit opinion. Unfortunately, those meetings occurred just before the senior audit manager went on parental leave, and in his absence, no one else ensured that the minutes were drawn up and placed on the file. And when he came back from parental leave, um, he didn't remember to check whether the minutes had been drawn up and placed on the file, um, uh, and so it was that they weren't. The absence of the minutes wasn't noticed until the subsequent AQR inspection. Even worse, by the time it was realised that the minutes were missing from the file, they had been promised to the AQR team. And as a result, the senior manager 
and the audit partner both played a role in drawing up the minutes, the contents of which were, was informed by material which did date back to the time of the audit. The, due, the new documents were duly passed to the AQR team, but as I've said, without any accompanying acknowledgement as to their provenance. Preparation of the minutes also involved the audit junior, who was instructed by the senior manager when the instruction was given in an email, so it was there for the entire world to see. And he was instructed by the senior manager to find some word documents dating from the time of the audit into which the text of the newly created minutes could be dropped. He was also asked, again by email, um, to ensure that the minutes, once he dropped the text in, should look like minutes produced at the time of the audit. Now, the tribunal found that the audit junior had compelling evidence that those giving him instructions in relation to the minutes were not acting honestly. In particular, the audit senior's instruction that the minutes should look like minutes created at the time, uh, and also the, insert the insertion of the text of the draft minutes into four different base documents, each selected by the junior because it originated from shortly after the date of the relevant um, meeting. Now, if that was not the junior's own decision, then it must have been as the result of what he was instructed to do. Uh, and that made it all the more obvious that there was nefarious intent behind the creation of the new documents. It was said on behalf of the audit junior, and he gave evidence to the effect that he gave, that, that he gave, uh, that he had complied with the instructions without thought as to their propriety. And that evidence was squarely rejected. The tribunal holding that the instructions he had received were, quote, highly unusual and would have raised questions in anyone's mind. Yet, Mr. Poor, the name of the junior, chose to implement the instructions. Thus, the tribunal concluded that the junior had become a party to the deliberate misleading of the AQRT. The audit file should also have contained, but did not contain, evidence explaining how construction contracts had been selected for substantive testing. That omission was made good, um, so to speak, by the creation many months later of the CCS paper. It was produced against significant pressure of time. Uh, not only had the CCS paper again been promised to the AQRT, but its author, a gentleman by the name of Mr Kitchen, who was the only person with sufficient knowledge of the relevant part of the audit, was due to head off on honeymoon. He spent the last three days before his departure, I think to the Seychelles or somewhere equally exotic, creating the document which was duly provided to the AQR team at the same time as the minutes, again, without its provenance being made clear. Mr Kitchen was found to have been dishonest. The tribunal also found that the audit partner for Mr Ian and another manager of Mr Bennett were well aware that the new CCS paper sent to the AQR team was a document created for the purposes of the AQR, which they allowed to be falsely represented to the AQR team as being a contemporaneous audit working paper. Yet, the tribunal found that the relevant conduct of Mr. Paul with respect to the meeting minutes and that of Mr. Meehan and Mr. Bennett with respect to the CCS paper amounted to a lack of integrity rather than dishonesty. The reasons why the tribunal found that those respondents had lacked integrity and made no, no finding of dishonesty against them on those charges are not apparent from the tribunal's report. The tribunal's decision therefore brings into sharp relief the question of whether there is a distinction between dishonesty on the one hand and lack of integrity on the other, and if so, what that distinction might be. <coughs> Many thanks, David. Well, as the title to my slide suggests, I'm going to begin by taking you through the evolution, the civil test for dishonesty. And in particular, I want to start that journey with the House of Lords decision between Cetra and Yardley. Now, the reason for starting here, and indeed for carrying out such an analysis, 
is not because we are on what's been described in the authorities as a Socratic quest for the ultimate truth, but rather because, in our view, the difficulties that discipline, disciplinary tribunals have had in distinguishing between lack of integrity on the one hand and dishonesty on the other hand can in fact be traced back to the House of Lords decision in Transectra. The facts of Transectra itself are relatively straightforward. Mr Leach was a practising solicitor. Towards the end of 1992, he acted for Mr Yardley in a transaction which included the negotiation of a loan of £1 million from a company called Transectra Limited. Another firm of solicitors, Sims, represented themselves as acting on behalf of Mr Yardley. Sims received the loan monies from Transectra in return for a rather unusual undertaking, that amongst other things, the loan monies would be retained until they were applied in the acquisition of property on behalf of Mr Yardley, and also that the loan monies would be utilised solely for the acquisition of property on behalf of Mr Yardley and for no other purpose. Now, needless to say, Sims paid the money to Mr Leach on Mr Yardley's instructions in breach of the undertaking, and subsequently Mr Leach, despite being aware of the terms of the undertaking, then paid the loan monies out upon Mr Yardley's instructions without himself taking any steps to ensure that the loan monies were utilised solely for the acquisition of property on behalf of Mr Yardley. Now, the upshot of all of this was that some £350,000 was used by Mr Yardley for purposes other than the acquisition of property. The loan was not repaid, uh, and Twincetra <coughs> sued all the parties involved. And one of the questions for the House of Lords on appeal was whether Mr Leach had acted dishonestly in assisting Sims in a breach of trust. Now, in respect of that question, at first instance, Mr Justice Carnwith had found that in paying out the money without concerning himself about its application, Mr Leach had shut his eyes to the truth, but that although that approach was misguided, it was not dishonest. The Court of Appeal disagreed and they disagreed on the basis that the fact that Mr Leach had willfully closed his eyes to the problem was sufficient for a finding of dishonesty. However, the majority of the House of Lords overturned the Court of Appeal on this point, and importantly for present purposes, in doing so it applied the same two-stage test as the criminal law for dishonesty as set out by the Court of Appeal in the case of Gauche. Now, you will note from the slide um, that I've included the, the test on the slide and, and that there are two stages to the test in Gauche. The first is whether what the defendant did was dishonest according to the ordinary standards of reasonable and honest people. And just pausing there, I, I note that that first stage requires objective dishonesty. The second stage is that if it was dishonest by those standards, whether the defendant realised himself what he was doing was dishonest. And so importantly, stage two required the defendant to have subjectively understood that he or she was acting dishonestly. It was the introduction of that second stage with its subjective element that marked a departure from previous authority in relation at least to, to this to the civil law in, in the context of, of dishonesty. Following Twincetra, the two-stage test was applied by disciplinary tribunals who were asked to make a finding of dishonesty. So in Hoodless and FSA, which is the first case on the slide, the applicant challenged a decision by the FSA to withdraw their approvals to perform the functions of an investment advisor and an investment manager. And at paragraph 19 of its decision, the tribunal expressly considered whether they should apply a purely objective test of dishonesty on the basis that one of the statutory objectives of the SM FSMA was the protection of consumers. However, this approach was roundly rejected by the tribunal in favour of applying the two-stage test in Concetra. And interestingly, one of the reasons the tribunal gave for rejecting such an approach 
was that the objective of the statutory protection of consumers would also be achieved by the fact that the tribunal had been asked to consider a finding of a lack of integrity, which the tribunal said involved application of objective standards. Also on the slide is the case of Altitude and SRA, where the Court of Appeal upheld a finding of dishonesty made against the solicitor applying the two-stage test into etc. <coughs> now, that takes us to the next important point in this journey, which is the decision of the Privy Council and Barlow Close. That case again concerned whether a respondent had given dishonest assistance, this time in relation to the misappropriation of funds. However, here, the Privy Council reinterpreted to etc. so as to eliminate element two, the subjective element of the test, from the definition of dishonesty, at least in relation to civil cases. However, despite the rolling back from to etc. that we see in Barlow Close, disciplinary tribunals continued to apply the two-stage to etc. test as it was understood before Barlow Close. So for example, in Bryant, which is the penultimate case on the slide, the administrative court overturned two findings of dishonesty made by the tribunal on the basis that the subjective element of the two-stage test was not satisfied. <coughs> and a similar approach was also taken by the Solicitor's Disciplinary Tribunal and in the more recent case of Scott, which is also on the slide, and which David is going to refer to in a bit more detail later. However, Shortly after Scott, <coughs> it is Lord Justice Rupert Jackson eloquently put it in the case of Wingate, the tectonic plates of the legal firmament moved following the UK Supreme Court's decision in Ivy and Genting, where the Supreme Court expressly disapproved of the Court of Appeals decision in Gauche. Now, the facts of this decision will be well known to a lot of you here, and however, they're quite interesting, so, so I'm going to repeat them in a bit of detail. <coughs> <coughs> I'll summarise them on the slide. In short, Mr Ivy was a professional gambler. He won around 7.7 .7 million from a Genting casino playing a game of Punto Banco, <coughs> which is quite a complicated card game. And he won those significant sums of money deploying an even more complicated, highly specialist technique known as edge sorting, which is so complicated I'm not even going to bother trying to explain it. <laughs> But, but the casino then refused to pay out his winnings on the basis that they took the view that this method uh, was cheating. Mr Ivy was adamant that he had not cheated because he did not, and, and importantly the judge at first instance found as a matter of fact that he did not, consider edge sorting to be cheating, and therefore he argued he was not dishonest and, and therefore hadn't cheated, because applying second subjective limb of the test in Gauche, uh, he had not been dishonest. And, and it was this issue that, that caused the Supreme Court to carry out an extensive analysis of both the criminal and civil law on dishonesty. And then following this extensive analysis, at paragraph 74, Lord Hughes confirmed for all purposes the test for dishonesty. Now, you'll see I've put the entirety of paragraph 74 on the slide. I I'm not going to read it out in full. However, you will note from the, the, the bolded text which I've added that whilst the first stage of this new test involved a subjective element, namely ascertaining the actual state of the individual's knowledge firstly, the key part of the test, particularly for our purposes today, which is the second emboldened section of the text, was that for all purposes, the test for dishonesty was in effect restricted to the first limb, the objective element of the test in Gauche and into etc. Finally, just before turning to the next section of this talk, I want to make one final point on the law, which is important for reasons that David will come on to discuss. And that point is that, as some of you will no doubt know, it's also possible for someone to be fraudulent at common law, not only if they know a statement to be false, 
but also if they're reckless uh, as to its truth or falsity. And of course the authority for that is the House of Lords decision in Derry Peak. And as I say, that's going to be important later on in the talk, yeah, for reasons David will come on to explain. And with that point, I now want to turn to look at the concept of integrity in a bit more detail. Integrity is a concept which has been described in the authorities as a nebulous concept and one which is not easy to define. Similarly, there's no clear all-purpose definition or test in the case law like we now have for dishonesty following ivy. However, at its heart, it's a regulatory concept, so I think it's therefore helpful to look at some of the codes of conduct to see if anything can be gleaned from them. And in that regard, I've picked three examples. The first example is the SRA principles, which at least I hope some of you will be quite familiar with. <laughs> the most recent version is dated, I think, around 2018. And you will note from the slide that Principle 4 requires solicitors to act with honesty. And Principle 5 requires solicitors to act with integrity. And just to pause there, I, I want to just note that this was not the case under the 20, 2011 version of the principles, which were, for example, the relevant principles in force in the case of Wingate, which we're going to come on to look at in a bit more detail later. And, that, and in respect of those principles, or the version of those principles, dishonesty was not a specific principle which solicitors were required to comply with, but it was rather treated as an aggravating offence when solicitors were charged, or dishonesty rather was charged as an aggravating offence when solicitors were charged with a breach of those principles. The second example is the BSB Code of Conduct. And in particular, you will see from Core Duty 3 that this provides that barristers must act with both honesty and integrity. So, so again, the BSB Code of Conduct is treating honesty and integrity as distinct concepts, at least for the purposes of Core Duty 3. And finally, the third example is the ICAEW. Code of Ethics. Now here you will see section 1110 provides that accountants must comply with five fundamental principles, including integrity. And whilst honesty is not one of those five principles, section 111 expands on the definition of integrity and sets out what acting with integrity requires, which it says includes acting with honesty. So slightly differently from both the SRA <coughs> principles and, and the BSB Code of Conduct, honesty is not treated as a, by the IC, ICAEW as a separate principle, but rather it's seen as part of the definition of integrity. Okay. So tying both sections of the talk thus far together, I think it's firstly fair to say that it's not clear really from any of the professional codes, one, what is meant by integrity, and two, what the distinguish, distinction between integrity and honesty is, if anything. In addition, as David will go on to explain, I think it's also fair to say that we can see from some authorities that despite the Privy Council's guidance and Barlow Close, and subsequently the Supreme Court's decision in Ivy, disciplinary tribunals have still struggled to grapple with the concept of lack of integrity and its relationship with dishonesty. In particular, as a lot of you who practice in this area will be aware, in many cases regulators have imported the notion of a lack of integrity as being distinct from dishonesty. Further, in many cases, we also see that respondents are alternatively charged with dishonesty or lack of integrity. And on occasion, as David explained in the case, in, in the Corellian decision, that they're, they're alternatively charged with dishonesty or lacking integrity, and on occasion they are acquitted of dishonesty, but found to have acted with a lack of integrity, 
And often in these cases, it's left up to appeal courts to explain how that could be so. And the most detailed attempt to square that circle between the two concepts is to be found in Lord Justice Rupert Jackson's judgment in the case of Wingate and SRA. Now, I'm going to turn to look at what was decided in Wingate before I hand you back to David, who's going to look at the dichotomy in practice. Wingate itself concerned two conjoined appeals against cases involving allegations of misconduct against solicitors. The allegations in the first case, Wingate and Evans, concerned solicitors, funnily enough, Mr. Wingate and Mr. Evans. And Mr. Wingate had signed a written litigation funding agreement that provided a loan of £900,000 to the firm and which importantly expressly provided that the loan monies could only be used for funding specific cases. However, there was also a subsequent oral agreement between the parties, which was said to have superseded the written agreement and which provided that the loan monies could be used for other general purposes. And rather predictably, Mr. Whitney and Mr. Evans then used the loan monies for purposes other than litigation funding, largely to repay debts. Thereafter, Mr. Whitney was then charged with what were then breaches of principle two, acting with integrity, and principle six, maintaining trust and confidence in the profession, alongside dishonesty. Mr. Evans was also charged with breaches of principles two and six. The tribunal initially cleared both appellants of those charges on the basis that, amongst other things, Mr. Wingate genuinely believed <coughs> that the funding agreement was made by the oral agreement, and that Mr. Evans was wholly reliant on Mr. Wingate and uh, had acted reasonably placing such reliance on him. The tribunal's decision, however, was overturned by the administrative court on appeal. And in sum, Mr. Justice Holman had held that the written litigation funding agreement was a complete sham, and Mr. Wingate had acted in breaches or in breach of principles two and six in signing it and then subsequently drawing money down pursuant to it. He also found that Mr. Evans had displayed manifest incompetence by failing to read the funding agreement and understand its implications, and he was therefore in breach of principle six. I note, however, that the allegation of dishonesty was dropped by the SRA on the appeal to the administrative court, and then, of course, the solicitors then appealed to the Court of Appeal to reinstate their acquittals. In the second case, Mr. Mallins backdated a notice of funding, I should say Mr. Mallins was also a solicitor, and he backdated a notice of funding, which was then sent to the other side in litigation in order to circumvent, circumvent a bar to recovery of an insurance premium where the original notice was said to have been lost. He was charged with, amongst other things, one, a lack of integrity <coughs> and undermining the public trust and confidence in the profession in relation to the backdating of the notice itself, and two, with a lack of integrity as well as dishonesty in relation to the deploying of the notice in litigation to the fact of sending it to the other side. The tribunal found him guilty on all counts. However, somewhat surprisingly, this was overturned by Mr Justice Moyston on appeal, who held that amongst other things, dishonesty and integrity have the same meaning, and therefore the fact that he had been charged with dishonesty in relation to the first two counts, i.e. the breaches of principles two and six in relation to the backdating of the document, but not in respect of the third count, namely the deploying of the notice in the litigation, was illogical, led to great confusion, and required the matter to be retried. In determining those appeals, the Court of Appeal was therefore required to distinguish between the two concepts of dishonesty and lack of integrity. And in this regard, Lord Justice Rupert Jackson carried out an extensive analysis of the authorities and concluded, firstly, as a matter of common parlance and as a matter of law, integrity was a broader concept than honesty. Second, as I already mentioned earlier, that integrity was a more nebulous and less easy to define concept 
they don't want to state the issue. Third, this integrity was a useful shorthand to express higher standards which society expects from professional persons and which the professions in turn expect from their own members. And the underlying rationale for this was said to be that professions have a more trusted role in society and in return are required to live up to their own professional standards. Fourth, that it was not helpful to formulate an all-purpose comprehensive definition of integrity. However, fifthly and finally, that broadly, integrity connotes adherence to the ethical standards of one's own profession, which involves more than mere honesty. So applying those principles, the Court of Appeal upheld the High Court's decision in respect of Mr Wingate, and in particular they found that although the SRA accepted Mr Wingate had acted honestly, his failure to act in accordance with, with um, the written contract meant he failed to adhere to the higher expected standards of the solicitor's profession. However, the Court of Appeal interestingly overturns the findings in relation to Mr Evans, Mr Evans, sorry, on the basis that he did not act with manifest incompetence in relying on Mr Wingate. And finally, in relation to the appeal in Malins, the Court of Appeal overturned the High Court's decision and in doing so stressed that he had erred in his conclusion, or that Mr Justice Morrison had erred in his conclusion, that lack of integrity and dishonesty were the same thing. Now, with that, we would hand back to David, who will look at in a bit more detail the dichotomy between the two concepts and practice and whether Lord Justice Ripper Jackson's distinction in actual fact stands up to scrutiny. Uh, lots of promises have been made by Connor in the course of um, what he said, which I will try to fulfil, uh, and if I don't, I apologise in advance. Um, it's important to remember that the issue in Wingate with which um, Rupert Jackson was grappling was whether it was open to a tribunal to find a lack of integrity in the absence of an allegation of dishonesty or in the absence of a finding, express finding, of dishonesty. Um, Lord Justice Jackson said it was effectively open to a tribunal to do so because um, the two concepts were distinct, um, or, albeit related. And to make good the distinction between the two, um, he went through a series of prior disciplinary cases, uh, which in his view demonstrated a lack of integrity as opposed to dishonesty. Um, and as we say, let me get on the right side, uh, slide, um, at least some of those cases, so to HA, all of them, um, have features which might be thought to support a finding of dishonesty um, as defined in Ivy. So let's have a look at uh, the shopping list. And we start with Emina, or Emiana, depending on how one wants to pronounce it. Now, in that case, um, where a finding of lack of integrity was made against the respondent solicitors, they had participated in a sham partnership and they had done so in order to conceal from both their clients and mortgage lenders that the practice in question was really a sole practice operated by an inexperienced solicitor. Um, my imagination is, is not sufficiently great to allow me to understand how that is not dishonest um, on an Ivy Agenti basis. Um, in Cham, um, you had a case where the solicitor's clients are not informed of the true nature and risk of a stamp duty uh, land tax um, scheme. Um, so they're not told that they may have to pay it all, they may have to pay some interest on top and some penalties. Uh, and the reason they weren't advised of those risks, as found by the um, Court of Appeal, um, was that the solicitors had not wished to deter their clients from entering into arrangements with the scheme promoters from which the solicitors would personally benefit. Um, again, I'm at a slight loss to explain why that doesn't amount to dishonesty. 
Um, it is plainly conduct which on its face is dishonest and would be recognised as such by any honest person. Um, Brett is another divisional court, uh, sorry, administrative court case in which the SDT issued a finding of dishonesty and the administrative court said the um, SDT having decided that the solicitor was not dishonest could not then find that the solicitor for purposes of sentence um, had knowingly misled the court because obviously that would be dishonesty. So the administrative court said that there's a way around this problem because what the SDT should have found, having decided it wasn't dishonest, was that the solicitor had recklessly allowed the previous court to be misled because the solicitor had been aware of the risk that the court might be misled, or would be misled, and decided to take that risk. Uh, and that approach in Brett by the administrative court raises a further question, which is what is meant by recklessness in, in the context of disciplinary proceedings. Here you come to a talk on integrity and honesty and you get the bonus of recklessness as well. Uh, now, to answer that question, what the disciplinary tribunals and courts mean by um, recklessness, one needs to look no further than the UP Tribunal's decision in Tinney and the Financial Conduct Authority in 28, 2018, which was followed more recently in, in Forsyth and the FCA in 2021. Uh, and I quote, one example of a lack of integrity not involving dishonesty, uh, really, it is recklessness as to the truth of statements made to others who will or may rely on them, or willful disregard of information contradicting the truth of such statements. Um, if anyone wants to explain to me why that doesn't constitute dairy and beef fraud, please find me afterwards, because I don't understand um, why it doesn't amount to dairy and beef fraud. It, it is a form of dishonesty which satisfies both limbs of the Ivy and Gentian test because an honest person would not make unqualified statements when they are aware of real grounds for doubting the truth of those statements and were aware also that the recipient of the statements might therefore be misled. Um, Scott has been touched on by Connor and that was a case in which the only reason why the Solicitor's Disciplinary Tribunal failed to make a finding of dishonesty was because it concluded that the second stage of the twin sector test was not satisfied. So in other words, it's pre-IV case, it cannot survive IV, and it doesn't provide support for the suggestion that it was a case that didn't involve dishonesty, as well as a lack of integrity. Uh, Newell Austin is next in the shopping list. That was another case in which um, the two-stage twin sector test had been assumed to be the correct test for establishing dishonesty in professional disciplinary proceedings. <coughs> the appellant solicitor tried to import a subjective element into the test for, um, for acting without integrity, which was the lesser charge that he had faced or she had faced uh, and of which she or he had been potted. Um, uh, and that attempt failed on the basis that the test for lack of integrity was purely objective. But again, it doesn't <coughs> help establish um, the proposition for which it was cited in Wisbet. Um, Williams and SRA um, it is yet another case which assumes that the two stage twin sector test needed to be satisfied in order to establish dishonesty. Um, it was an administrative court case in which the judge was no other than um, Mrs. Justice Carr, as she then was, um, formerly of this parish, uh, and um, who was the successful advocate in the Supreme Court in Twin Sector. Uh, and her judgment in, in Williams included the following. Want of integrity arises when objectively judged. A solicitor fails to meet the high professional standards to be effective be expected of a, a solicitor. It does not require the subjective element of conscious wrongdoing. Well, um, nor does the test for dishonesty um, as laid down by Ivy. Um, that brings us to the conclusions. And I started um, 
this lecture by reference to the tribunal's decision in the KPMG Carillion Water Quality Review case. Um, by reference to the decision to find that certain of the respondents um, were guilty of acting without integrity, um, but holding back from making findings of dishonesty. O on the underlying facts as found by the tribunal, it, it is difficult to see how those respondents could have complained if findings of dishonesty had been made. Despite the regulatory sector at times giving the appearance that it is a legal island, which stands proud of the lapping waters of the general law when it comes to the identification of dishonesty, I consider that the true position can be simply stated. First, it is axiomatic that dishonesty will, in all cases, involve acting with a lack of integrity. Second, while it is possible to act with a lack of integrity which falls short of dishonesty, such cases are likely to be rare, and certainly more rare than the authorities indicate. Examples where a distinction might properly be made could include a sexual relationship between a very junior member of staff and someone very senior in circumstances where the nature of that relationship is corrosive of the trust which might generally be expected to be placed in such a senior member of staff. Um, or even where a senior member of staff takes side in, sides inappropriately in a dispute between more junior members of staff uh, and does so for no good reason, rather than maintaining the objectivity, or dare I say the decorum, reasonably to be expected of someone in, in their position. So in other words, the senior member of staff takes against one of the protagonists in the dispute because they have a favourite uh, and they allow their judgement to become clouded um, by their favouritism rather than maintaining objectivity. That could, in extreme circumstances, I think, potentially be classed uh, as a lack of integrity. Uh, but in conclusion, it seems to me that regulators and tribunals have got themselves into something of a pickle in many cases in seeking to distinguish between, between dishonesty uh, and lack of integrity, where the underlying facts, as alleged and found, do not allow such a distinction to be validly or sensibly drawn. Such a modelled approach is not without some advantages, however. As in the KPMG case, and particularly with respect to the audit junior, who one might feel is something of a victim of um, the atmosphere and the environment in which he found himself. Uh, the charging of the lesser offence of acting without integrity can provide a route by which a tribunal can mark its disapproval of a respondent's conduct without making the blunt and normally terminal finding of a lack of, of, of uh, sorry, that the respondent was acting dishonestly. It may also provide a route by which respondents can potentially negotiate with regulators to achieve a mutually acceptable outcome which short, falls short of a, an explicit admission of dishonesty and, and the concomitant inevitability of a lengthy period of disqualification. Whether the, the availability of such a route is truly in the public interest may be a debate for another occasion. Uh, that is all we've got to say, subject to any questions you want encouraged to ask, any questions, if anyone's got any burning questions that they want to ask, please feel free um, to do so for a couple of minutes before you um, go and grab a cup of coffee before the next round. David, you described the effect of a... <clears throat> A dishonesty finding is terminal. It's true, isn't it, that when these cases come to the tribunal, uh, respondents will employ expensive barristers arguing tooth and nail that they're not guilty of dishonesty. And this alternative of integrity is something which they may then be able to preserve some form of career, perhaps not in the current regulated career that they're in. So, to what extent would you say that the tribunal has been influenced by 
that reputational factor and the amount of uh, argument being brought to, to bear in terms of a professional's future reputation? I, I think tribunals are always aware of the impact of a finding of dishonesty. Um, I wouldn't go as far as to suggest that tribunals are in fact influenced or um, driven to make findings of lack of integrity in cases where they believe that someone has been dishonest. Um, but the availability of the alternative route may operate as a subconscious level. Whether it has done so in any particular case, I think is a matter of speculation. I don't take any particular case and suggest that that availability of the, the opt-out has in fact um, influenced the result. But um, it, it is an oddity. Um, being a simple person, I long for a simple world in which people say, you knew what you were doing was wrong. Uh, you knew someone might be misled or you, might, you were reckless as to whether they would be misled uh, and therefore you were dishonest. Um, uh, and such a simple system has quite a lot to commend it. I mean, isn't it, isn't it somewhat the same as my understanding of what used to happen in the 1960s, which was juries were unwilling to convict drivers of manslaughter charges, and that's what gave rise to the uh, offences of death by dangerous driving. It, it certainly could be a bit of it, but um, we're dealing with professional tribunals, which um, ought to deal with things on facts as, as they see them. <laughs> I think that's a hint. <laughs> but human beings nonetheless. They're human beings nonetheless. I mean, one could argue about whether, in practical terms, the findings that were made in the Carillion, um, the finding of a lack of integrity on those charges in Carillion, really made a huge amount of difference, given the underlying findings of fact um, also made by the Tribunal. Um, in, in the context of the audit partner and the, the, the other manager, it made no difference at all because they were really found guilty of dishonesty and other charges. Respect to minutes and also in the case of the manager with respect to regenesis. So they were both toast for a long time. They were both going to be disqualified for a long time. Um, but um, permanent disqualification doesn't seem to be on the, the agenda for the um, FRC. Um, I suppose it could be in extreme circumstances, but the, the starting point for a finding of dishonesty is normally 10 years disqualification. So certainly there is a recognition that sinners may repent and you can allow them back into a professional Okay, I think we've had quick while we're ahead. Thank you all very much.